if you're watching this video, I will assume you've already heard of dark matter. This concept first arose in the 1930s with the galaxy rotation problem. So how does the galaxy rotation problem come about? If you measure the mass of the galaxy, you can use two methods. You can either infer the mass of the galaxy by looking at the total brightness of the entire galaxy, or you can measure the velocity of stars, especially the ones located at the periphery of the galaxy. You would expect that measuring the mass of the same galaxy with two methods will give you the same result. And that is not what happens. This is very problematic. You see these two plots? They should overlap, but they clearly do not. By the end of this video, you will know why and what those two plots represent. In this other picture, we see an artistic representation of the Milky Way, our galaxy. The yellow arrow indicates our own location within the Milky Way. The galaxy has a spiral, barred shape, and it's very symmetric. Why don't we take a minute to derive what we expect to observe? We will end up with the relationship between the mass of the galaxy and the velocity of stars within the galaxy. We can refer back to the figure shown previously. The lower plot will match our derivation. High school physics is really all that you need. We will be using two famous equations, which are Newton's second law and the law of gravity. You can see that both are expressions of force, but Newton's second law is more general. And so you can see what relationship must exist for any given force between the mass at which the force is applied and the acceleration subsequent to the application of this force. For the law of gravity, the force indicates the attraction between two bodies. Our two bodies of interest will be a star and the mass of the galaxy. And due to the principle of the center of mass, we can approximate the mass of the galaxy as being located at the center of the galaxy itself. Now, you remember from before that the galaxy is very symmetric, so it is safe to assume that the orbit of a star around a galaxy will be very symmetric and will be a circle itself. So, the acceleration that will end up plugging in Newton's second law is the one derived from circular motion. This picture will probably clarify all of what I'm saying. We'll pick a star at the periphery of the galaxy and we can approximate the orbit of the star around the galaxy as this big red circle. Then the straight line is the radius that connects the center of the mass of the galaxy with the star itself. Going back to the equations, we realize that the force expressed by Newton's second law and the law of gravity are actually the same quantity. We've discussed why we need to use the acceleration for circular motion. So this is the quantity that we're going to plug in into f equals ma. Here we have the entire derivation. You should set a law equals to law of gravity, and we simplify out both the mass of the star and one of the radii, and we finally obtain the relationship between the mass of the galaxy inside of the regions of the star and the velocity of the star itself. The star that we picked in the picture before was already at the periphery of the galaxy. But if we now consider a star a little further away than the previous one, we can see that the ring between these two orbits does contain some mass. But this mass is negligible compared to the mass of the entire galaxy. Therefore, it is safe to assume that the mass of the galaxy inside of circles for both of these stars should be more or less the same. The mass of the galaxy for the rest of this video will be taken as a constant. If the mass of the galaxy does not change, 
Oh, so this other side of the equation has to be a constant, as expressed right here. Now you see, there's another quantity which we have not discussed about that is not very, which is g, the gravitational constant. Hence, we can extrapolate a relationship between velocity of stars at the periphery where the mass of the galaxy is constant and their distance from the center of the galaxy. We finally have all the tools to understand the first picture. The galaxy is M33, and the graph represents its relative relationship between velocity and radius. Velocity is on the y-axis, and radius on the x-axis. The low plot is inferred from total luminosity, and is described by our derivation. The upper plot is measured from star velocities. In fact, the data points are precisely the star velocities at different radii from the galaxy's center of mass. You can see that there is a staggering discrepancy between data and expectations, because the measured star velocities are far too high. One way to reconcile these results is to assume the existence of matter that fails to be optically observed, namely dark matter. Within our equations, we will have this extra term added to the mass of the galaxy, because a higher mass over here will lead to a higher velocity. Now, the galaxy rotation problem offers only a justification for the existence of dark matter and does not rule out other possibilities. But other experiments, such as the cosmic microwave background or galaxy clusters, offer the irrefutable evidence for the existence of dark matter. If you're curious to learn more about all of these experiments and much more, please stay tuned and thank you for watching.